Hey, welcome back to the channel and welcome back to the Writer's Bookshelf. Uh, so, so far this season we've covered a lot of topics from how to defeat resistance to uh, just having realistic expectations to what your writing career may actually entail or, you know, your writing hobby or whatever it is that you decide to make of it. Um, how to create um, compelling characters and how to base them off of other compelling characters. And of course, setting scenes and, uh, you know, we've even looked at how to develop a, a real-time map and things if you've uh, looked at my channel beyond the writer's bookshelf and um, we've also just covered other things like tension emotion and of course all the important stuff with dialogue and so today we're going to do uh, in the next phase in our in our development and that's going of course you know looking for another person to write our book for us because you know it, writing is too hard and you know honestly if we could just get somebody else to do our writing for us, life would be so much easier. And I mean, honestly, I mean, what are we doing this ourselves for? It's stupid. Like, it's hard. Have you ever tried writing? It's really, really hard. And honestly, if, if you have the money, just pay someone else to do it. That's what ghostwriting is for. <laughs> Kidding. Plot twist. Okay. Um, so, clearly you don't want to pay somebody else to do your own writing for you because what else are you doing? This, this is for you and your audience and only you can tell your story even though you might possibly rip off a you know a plot that's already been done a thousand times because there's not really any new plots as we've learned throughout the series so far um, or you know would have learned if, uh, if we just actually practice our writing uh, but the way we develop stories does come down to our ideas and, and our characters and everything and um, one thing that we want to also consider is that you know the whole reason why we want to learn craft is because you want to learn how to develop a story that really keeps our readers interested and keeps them turning the pages. And you can have a compelling character. In fact, I just saw, read something um, recently, um, I think in one of my other books I'm going to be reviewing, if I'm not, not mistaken, or I might have seen it on an email. Uh, but they're talking about how creating characters is only interesting if the situation makes the character interesting. So, like, you know, you can do all the character development in the world, but if your character is just going to get his teeth cleaned, doesn't really make them that interesting. Um, so that's sort of the thing is when we're writing stories, we're trying to figure out the ways in which we can make not only our characters interesting, but the stories that they inhabit interesting. So that's where Mastering Plot Twist comes in play, and this is by uh, Jane uh, K. Cleland, who is also the author of another book that I hope to review next season called uh, Mastering Suspense and Throw uh, Tension, I think. Actually, I actually don't know what it's called, because I don't own the book yet, but I will uh, sometime probably this summer. Um, well, you're going to be watching this, I think, in summer. At any rate, um, we're going to cover that book at some point down the road. Um, but this is not that book. This is Mastering Plot Choice. And what's um, really nice about this book is it's, you know, to the point, it's really about what it says, Plot Choice. And it doesn't do all the, you know, fluffy overlap that some other books often do. It is really just limited to two components, or two parts, rather. The first part is going to be pre-plotting here and then the second one is actual plotting and what this does is this takes the approach of what she calls the TRD or it's the um, the twist the reversal and danger and these are the three things that uh, a writer needs to employ in his you know, story if he wants to keep the reader turning those pages and this isn't to say that it needs to happen on every page but this is the, the idea that your your story's benchmarks reflect on one of these components and so what this book is about is, is showing you how to get to a point where you can twist or reverse or danger. And what does that actually mean? Well, the twist would be when you get to a point in the story where, um, you know, the reader, and I hope I have this, this right, the reader has an expectation uh, that the scene is going in one direction and the twist might be what we just did, you know, with the... Um, you know, the fact that we're not hiring somebody to write our book, we actually are writing a plot twist. And so it, it's taking an idea in a scene or a series of scenes, a sequence, and you're, you're trying to set it up so that uh, the reader is delighted by the change in the direction. And um, just some of the things that she talks about would be, uh, for example, um, so we can find a good one for you here. Um, Oh, like, um, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it's 
So I had to take a quick pause actually because uh, this is actually one of those books that's a little challenging to find your way around because primarily you're looking through charts like this and I guess I should probably explain that ahead of time. I hope you can see that. Uh, this chart over here, very common to see these kinds of, of charts through this out this book. Here's another one. Um, that's one of the things about this book that's difficult to, to digest is you have so many examples and figurines that you find your way around. It's a little difficult. So I didn't normally, I didn't jump to the page that I wanted quite as quickly as I hoped. Um, so you do have some normal text here. It's not all, it's not all thick, dense, uh, like here's some normal pages. It's not all, it's not all dense tactics. But anyway, what I was trying to do is I was trying to find an example of the three different types for you. Um, essentially what she's trying to accomplish here is to show that a twist is, is sort of the way in which the story changes direction. It doesn't necessarily mean it's unexpected, but it definitely takes a story in an interesting place that you want to, um, you know, your reader is going to want to be more engaged. Like, okay, well, that was interesting. The thing just happened. Now I got to find out where that's going to lead to. So it's, um, and you can also think of the twist too as like the separate branches. Like if you're going down the road, you have a left uh, row and a right row. You know, the twist might be maybe you expect to go down the the lap, but then you choose the right instead. So. Um, just having your reader constantly wondering what are you going to do next is part of the nature of the T or the twist. But then you also have the reversal. Uh, this is something I think is interesting because the reversal is going in the opposite direction of what the reader expects. And so it's still believable and it's still credible. And one of the things that she talks about throughout the book is you do need to make sure you set your story up so that these things are believable. And I'm not going to get into all the details because that's why I'm recommending the book so you'll read it for yourself. Um, but one of the things that she establishes is that when you are able to give the reader a clear enough kind of uh, playing table, if you want to call it that, or basically you're setting the table with, with the components that you need in order to make the story work, and that includes your twist and your reversals and things. You know, the character needs to be believable in, in the choice that they make, um, but then the, the choices that they make also need to, to be believable in the context of not just the characters themselves, but the world that you've established. So she references um, another writer uh, that I think it was, um, who was it? It's, um, it, I actually don't remember the author at the top of my brain, someone from the mid-century if I recall, but, but his point of view is that you have to put doors and alleys and what he's saying and what she's reiterating in this door through, in through alleys situation um, is that you, if you're, if you have a, a person in danger, which is the D and, and TRD, and they're going down an alley and then suddenly they pull some vines back and there's a door, well, your reader's going to feel chipped because that was an easy escape. But what the, what the um, original author was saying, well, if you need a door in the alley for the reader to, or for the um, protagonist to escape in, well, it might be that maybe you have to go back earlier in the book and, you know, build that door. So what she's saying is, is when sometimes you won't know what you need until you get there, but to avoid any contrivance, you need to go back and, and put the seed in the uh, place where that uh, requirement comes. Um, even with like Harry Potter in the room for requirement, you know, you, it's kind of a catch-all, um, kind of convenient way of, of building the thing you need in order to make the story work. But in order to avoid the reader rolling his eyes, um, you know, when you do reveal that door, you have to establish that same alley earlier in the story and establish that that door is there. So when they go through there, it's not suddenly so contrived. Not that I necessarily think that's entirely true, because sometimes I think um, you can set up the, the contrivance by doing that motion. I mean, of course you're going to choose that alley. It's how convenient. But, but for, in the heat of uh, writing and if your story's exciting enough, most readers probably won't pick up on that until they're past the point of carrying so it's something to consider. And I am tr still trying to figure out who said that. I just was looking at it earlier and I've already lost a set. But um, but anyway, what this book de definitely or ultimately does is it, um, it's actually not too long. It's it's just over 200 pages, but it's the um, there's charts that really make it dense and make it a little difficult to get through in an overnight read. Um, but one thing I like about it is it is straightforward. It doesn't try to throw in too many ideas at you it's just it it gives you um examples from two of her works in progress one 
is a story about um, a political. She, she's a, somebody who has a, a sister who's like in a scandalous situation, and and the woman is running for uh, president, and it's just the whole conflict that comes with trying to keep the si sister secret. And so she's using the the TRD as a reference point uh, to chart that story, and it's um, and where it's the various twists and reverses and things happen. And then you have um, a coming of age story uh, or young adult story about a kid who has to rescue his sister from these fairies. And so you have, um, throughout the whole book, she goes back to these stories and, and shows how she implements the that particular skill to that part of the story in order to make it more compelling and more, and more logical. Um, and then eventually she gets into things like the perception gap, which, you know, is the idea that you have um, what you believe may be different than what is presented. Uh, or what you what you assume may be different than what's actually presented, and then you have I, I think I got that right, um, and then um, like for example in the science of perception, perception is well studied if not always well understood. Nonetheless, scientific research uh, can provide rich fodder for stories that resonate with emotional authenticity. To add authenticity to your stories, take a look at these intriguing nuggets. So. She refers to a bullet, says, how do you know she was upset? A Psychology Today article entitled, The Difference Between Highly Sensitive and Hypersensitive, explains that a highly sensitive person is aware of subtle noises, faint uh, changes in mood or atmosphere, and slight distinctions in sense and taste that escape most people's notice, but HSPs might not know that their ability to read people in situations is unusual. Why would they? To them, it's the norm. And then you have um, something between colors. Is that uh, cerise or crimson? And it talks about how um, men see basically red and orange, and women can see cerise, whatever. If, that, if I even pronounce that correctly, in crimson. So that's all in the perception gap section there. Um, and with that, again, it's highlighting the way people respond to information and, and what they, they know and all that. Um, so that's just an interesting section. But anyway, um, the point I'm making is that there's all these different elements that come into play in how to establish your character's um, credibility and your reader's ability to, to um, not agree, but your, your reader's ability to believe that the situation is authentic um, and how to still keep it, the pages turning without being contrived and without being uh, ridiculously um, plotted and all that. So um, that's just a core example of what the book is. There's some other things in here too. There's oh, the D in danger, I forgot to mention is uh, when you throw in an element of danger to keep things interesting. And again, you don't want to make, you don't want to overstuff any of this to the point of absurdity, uh, but you do need to figure out what your pacing of your story is um, in order to make sense of it. So she makes the example of uh, Dan Brown's uh, Da Vinci Code and how there's, a, I think, what, eight TRDs in the first few pages. And then there's another book she referenced where there's like not even eight in the entire book. Um, and it just depends on what the book needs. So that also, um, she makes the point too that the TRDs are what you need in order to adequately pace your book. So if you want a slow book, then you have fewer TRDs. And if you need a fast book, you have more TRDs. Uh, so it's a really interesting way to bring it all together. And I don't want to give the whole thing away. I just, I think this is one of those books where if you can stand all the breaks in the charting like this, and she does, by the way, give you um, places where you can do your own practice. Um, not that I would ever write in a book, but if you're the kind of person who doesn't mind writing in a book, you can certainly use her the empty charts to do your own practice. Because she does invite you to think about um, your own uh, development and your own story and, and what you're working on. Um, but uh, if you can stand going through all those little tiny fonts and, and all of that, I do think that this is one where it, I think it's a must read. Um, you know, is it a bookshelf book or is it a library book? I mean, I, again, I, I'm a fan of just having the reference ready to go if I ever need to go back to it. Uh, the fact that, you know, ICE, uh, if I need to remember what that is. Um, the fact that I don't remember off the top of my head tells me that one day I might want to go back and look it up. Um, but um, to actually answer the question, if you're wondering, um, this is in the fire and ice section, or fine fire and ice. Um, the IACE stands for Intrigue, Credibility, and Evidence. And if you'd like to know more about how those are integrated into the book, you should read the book. 
because um, ultimately, again, why are we doing this but to you know read the book? Um, but yeah, I just I think this is one of those books where if you um, if you do give this a chance, I think you'll appreciate it. Um, I think she's a really you know insightful writer um, and really insightful storyteller and plotter. I, I haven't actually read her her novels, but her um, but her, the way she delivers the information here. I do think is um, it's well received. It's uh, it's it's well laid out. It, it's never too difficult to get through it. Um, she keeps it simple, and I do think that. I, and I peeked a little bit out of, out of her other book, um, so I definitely do want to do that for a future episode, um, probably early season three. Uh, but you can clearly jump ahead and take a look at that one um, if you would like. Um, it's mastering suspense, and um, I think actually. I think they refer to it. Um, it's this one here. If you can see it, it looks like this. Um, Mastering Suspense Structure and Plot. So that's her other book. Uh, I will be doing that in the future, most likely. Uh, but you don't need to wait for the video to come out to read it. Um, I, I think getting both together would probably be a smart move uh, if you do want to have your, uh, if you want to build up on your suspense and on your pacing and and your credibility and all that but it's another component i think in the writer's toolbox worth having uh, not every story needs these trds um to be to be worth reading but you kind of want them anyway to make sure that your structure does have a compelling drive through it and i think without that compelling drive it's easier for your reader to put it down and i think that's uh, the other thing that she mentions is that if you want your reader to lose sleep if you want your reader to, um, you know, <laughs> have a fight with his wife because, you know, he stayed up too late reading or, what, you know, the kids uh, missed the bus or I, I'm starting to throw out weird illusions. But if you want your reader to be invested to the point where they can't put it down, where they forget to eat, um, she says add a TRD. And, um, but again, make it work for your story. You can't just have it random. Otherwise, the reader's going to, you know, put it down. <laughs> Not just put it down, but put it down quickly. And maybe even, you know, donate it. So, um, it's just, I think it's worth going through and um, definitely add it to your list of, um, of important resources. So, so that's it for today. Um, that's, again, Mastering Plot Choice with Jane McClellan. Uh We'll be doing another book next week. Uh, we're going to be moving uh, back to kind of the bigger formed uh, topics now. Now that... There's still other craft elements we could probably talk about, but uh, I'm probably going to be saving those for the next season because that's going to be when we get into more like genre-related stuff. Um, so what we'll do next week is we're going to do another kind of quick overview for structure, and then uh, then we're going to kind of go into the back end of the season and some of the, the stuff to remember for uh, just cleaning up and making sure your, uh, your story works and all that. So that's what's coming ahead um, in the last few episodes of season two. So thanks again for watching. Again, uh, like and subscribe to all the things YouTubers try to do. If you have suggestions for books you'd like me to review um, in the future, just send a comment below. Uh, do bear in mind that, again, I, I do have a list of books that I'm trying to cover early on. So even if you recommend a book, it may be a while before I get to it. But I do want to, I like to know what people are interested in hearing more about. Or if you've read a book, maybe you don't need me to cover it, but maybe you've read it and want to suggest I cover it for everyone else. Uh, again, by all means, please suggest it. And if you're the author of one of these books, um, again, please let us know uh, anything else you want us to take from the book. You know, anybody who, who uh, checks out the comments below might be uh, you know, incentivized to see your uh, your voice and all this. So just, you know, something to consider. But anyway, that's it for today. Don't forget to, um, you know, you, you, can don't, or you can support this channel by checking out my books. Um, and then hopefully my website's open by now. Again, jeremybercy.com if you're uh, looking to bookmark it. If it's not open, just bookmark it. One of these days it will be open, hopefully. Um, but I'm sure by the time this goes live, if it's not open by then, I'm doing something wrong. Um, but, you know, if it's still closed, it doesn't necessarily do anything wrong. I'm just slow. So, anyway. All right, that's it. Um, see you next week. Hope you're all. Take care. Bye.